let me start. Lane and I, a few months ago, were in London. And on BBC, there was James Lovelock. And Lovelock has just written this book called Gaia's Revenge. And the interview went something like this. James, what kind of future do you see for humanity? Oh, it's all over. Civilization will be destroyed in this century. And the interviewer said, oh, James, that is so interesting. <laughs> How many people do you think will survive the century? Oh, maybe a half a billion. And do the math, you know, 6.5 up to 8.5 down to 0.5 billion. And oh, James, that is so interesting. <laughs> there, are, there are styles of discourse about this. Um, Oliver Sacks tells a story about Oliver, true story. Oliver was blind from nearly birth on, and he, uh, because of changes in medicine, they were able to restore most of Oliver's sight. And so he could see, but Oliver had constructed this world that was a beautiful world, people without blemishes, people who were desirable and thin and fit and so forth, and landscapes that were beautiful. And then when he got his sight, it wasn't the way it was up here. The world he constructed was far more beautiful than the world he, in fact, saw. So Oliver decided to lose sight. And Sachs, in telling the story, describes how sight is partly chosen. It is partly a decision on our part. I think nationally, we had a choice of sight. And it comes very close to what Tim Flannery describes as one of these windows or gates in the climate change science. It occurred in the late 70s to the early 1980s. And it culminated, I think, at the end of the Carter administration. Remember the Global 2000 report? That report, had we taken that seriously in 1980, would have made the United States much less vulnerable to events of 9-11. It would have made our transition to the era of efficiency and renewables a whole lot easier than it is likely to be for us from here on out. That was our moment of sight. It's partly a choice. Uh, what I want to do is to describe this, by the way, professors give a signed reading. This is one of my, this appeared in the Atlantic Monthly as a kind of a spoof of an advertisement, and it's a book we all wish could be written. <laughs> uh, I want to describe uh, several weeks of my life this uh, summer, and it began with a meeting up in uh, Yale University on the, the biophilia concept, and the, uh, it was organized by Steve Keller. And the issue is how do we take this uh, what E.O. Wilson calls innate affinity for life and lifelike processes and weave it into the built environment, biophilic design. And so what I've tried to portray here is my interpretation of what I think biophilia is going to result in. Um, we're in these brackets in trying to articulate the world around us. And a good bit of the conversation that I picked up in the last few days has been uh, based on our experience as creatures in the Holocene unbelievably fecund and beautiful world, but it was dangerous. There were predators. Uh, there were things that would kill us. There were volcanoes and there were storms and so forth, but it was beautiful. This was paradise. We're at the end of the Holocene, beginning to move into the Ecozoic or the Anthropocene, whatever name you want to give to it, but it's a radically different world. This line here uh, depicts two things. It depicts the forcing of climate into radically different states where the nature we experience will be increasingly capricious and dangerous at a global scale in a brand new kind of way. On the left side, we have the capacity now to create artificial worlds, simulated reality, virtual reality that will be increasingly desirable. Want to experience Aspen? Well, theoretically, I could stay in Oberlin, Ohio, go to a sensation parlor, be wired up, and experience somebody's version of Aspen given to me for a price as a simulation. Increasingly, as we move toward that world being forced into <coughs> radical climate change, the world on the left, virtual reality, as an escape 
or as a response to this innate affinity, this need for uh, contact with the natural world, will become increasingly seductive. We'll be seduced into a world where our needs for nature can be simulated. Down here at the bottom, uh, and this was kind of my rendition uh, done late last night, of the language will change. The language I put nature speak, uh, the beautiful words that we speak about nature. Many of you write so eloquently about this, but this will give way, I think, to very different kinds of language. For climate change, the language of trade-offs. And then over here for simply technique. But the words describing that we try to encapsulate our experience of nature will change as the experience of nature changes. Um, first, second, uh, second week. This is uh, Katrina, as seen by Noah. These are images that we all saw. They were beyond our capacity to describe easily. This is the first American city that was evacuated. And we were exposed to weeks of these kinds of uh, images. Anderson Cooper reporting directly from uh, New Orleans crying on screen, which was kind of a first. Back in June, um, Elaine and Adam and Mel and, and I were in New Orleans for an architectural competition. Part of the time we spent walking around or driving around New Orleans neighborhoods. This is what we saw. And I can't describe this. And I don't think the, the pictures do justice to what we experienced. These were places of catastrophe and tragedy, human neglect, and it went on for mile after mile. These were areas under a couple of feet of water to 12 to 15 feet of water. And you could only imagine what it was like to be there. Uh, repair work was going on, but houses knocked off their foundations, places where the uh, water hit houses at 40 to 50 miles per hour and simply either demolished them or moved them uh, radically. Uh, yeah, that is Brad Pitt. Uh, I just put that in there as for interest. Um, this is kind of an interesting picture. This was a house we walked into. That's my image on a mirror still hanging on the wall. But you can see the water line at the very top of the roof. I don't know the story behind the hole here. But there was a hole poked in a lot of the uh, first floor uh, rooms. As people trying to escape water, I presume, tried to get up into uh, attic areas. Can't describe New Orleans. And the very following week, we uh, took a, a group of Walmart executives on a flyover of West Virginia. To get cheap coal, what's happening in West Virginia and Kentucky and parts of uh, now Ohio and Tennessee, mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, you're looking at the remainder of the oldest mountains on earth. And to get at uh, the coal there, there are 35 seams of coal throughout the Appalachian area. The bottom seams are, are deep mining. You can only get to those by going down to the ground. But there are layers of coal. You can see the dark seams in the picture here, maybe a couple of feet thick, sometimes four or five feet thick, but not seldom much more than that. We've allowed coal companies to go in and knock the tops off the mountains, dump the tops of the mountains upside down as what's called valley fill uh, that now covers about uh, 1,000 miles of streams in West Virginia alone. This is now devastated about 1.5 million acres. The next million acres will be destroyed at the present rate uh, by the end of this decade. The amount of coal that they get out of this is about 10% or less, according to the U.S. Geologic Survey, of what is available. So as efficiency, this is unbelievable. What you're looking at, you can see in a radius 360 degrees what is now moonscape. There is no effective way to remediate this. You lower the mountains by 500 to 1,000 feet. Uh, you change the vegetation. Uh, effectively, what will grow on here is kind of like you know the chia grass that grows on those things you get at Christmas. That's about what will grow here, and that's it. Um, this is what you see. You see the corner of the wing here. The truck, which you can just barely make out right there, is a truck, the tires of which are about 12 feet in diameter. That's the scale. And you can see this is valley fill. So as they blow up parts of the mountains, and in these 11 counties south of Charleston, uh, they use about uh, 3 million 
pounds of explosives every day. This is a war against nature. The um, Valley Fills here, we flew this with Jack Spadaro. This is what it looks like on the ground. Um, Jack Spadaro was the mining engineer who was fired by the Bush administration for trying to enforce the uh, Surface Mining Act of 1977, flimsy as it is. But as we flew over this, Jack would point to valley fills below that were about to fail. You can tell by the face of this. You've got mountains and then in these valleys, some of which will run for six miles or so, but they're filled. These are mountains just turned upside down. There's effectively no water table in them. There's just gravel and the water percolates on down. This is, uh, Adam, remember that scene? This is the mountain uh, owned by uh, Larry Gibson called Caford Mountain. This was taken a year ago. And Caford Mountain is a long ridge that runs down this way, valley here, beautiful. Again, oldest uh, mountains on the face of the earth. Uh, some of the most diverse ecosystems found anywhere. This is what it looked like uh, four weeks ago. Uh, Larry's Mountain is back behind me and it's a 40 acre park. Uh, he has been in the family since 1700 and something. Um, they've kept it from being mined because they made it a park. Although the mining companies, because we separated long ago surface ownership and mineral rights below the land, the coal company here, Massey Energy, is augering out below the mountain. They'll collapse the mountain. It has two graveyards on it dating back to, with bodies dating back to the 1700s. Um, That's another scene of the same thing. You just see a little bit of the edge of this. What, a, a year ago, this was forested here. This is gone. This mountain is gone. Didn't get a very good picture of this. And the one over this way is gone. So you look around on a ruin of landscape, ruined landscape that's uh, 360 degrees in circumference. Uh, coming back, we flew over. This is the Marsh Fork Elementary School right here. This is a coal loading facility. And right here is a tower that's within uh, about 180 feet of the school. The coal dust here is so thick that kids who have never been in a mine have silicosis and black lung disease. Kids eight, nine, 10 years of age. Um, if you go back and flying around this, the school is down here. This is a slurry pond and they wash coal on site. And so when they wash it, the flocculants that precipitate out the, the heavy metals and so forth are carcinogenic. Uh, then you get this witch's brew, kind of like a, uh, if I had a, a bottle of it here, it would look like kind of a, a thin uh, asphalt. Cadmium, lead, selenium, mercury, uh, a witch's brew of everything you don't want to have uh, above the surface of uh, the earth. Below this are old mine tunnels. This can fail in two ways. This is an estimated three billion gallons of slurry. It can fail in two ways. It can fail because this is an earthen dam, and on a, uh, after, say, a rainy period, the dam is soggy. These give way. So far, about 230 have given way in West Virginia alone. They can also fail because this stuff is heavy stuff, and it breaks down through old mine tunnels below the ground. So if the shale bed below this is not thick enough, and it very seldom is, uh, it breaks down through old mine tunnels. Marsh Fork, to go back to this, Marsh Fork Elementary School, it's estimated that if and when this dam fails, these kids down here, if they happen to be in school at that time, will have two minutes from the point of failure to get out. Their escape plan is that the principal will run back to his office or her office, get a bullhorn, this is a high-tech escape plan, and will run through the school yelling, get out. And then notice the topography, where do they go? The wall of stuff coming down here, Jack Spadaro estimates, will be coming down at 50 miles an hour. It will be 50 to 60 feet high. Where do these kids go? The experience of nature. What stories do they tell what stories can they hear? This um, is the science we try to communicate. The connection, of course, between biophilia, New Orleans, and West Virginia is carbon. 
If you want to draw a map of connections, you could connect lots more sites. It is our failure to manage carbon that is causing huge problems in the world. We're here because of that failure. We flew in here, we drive in here, we, we have carbon-dependent lives. Uh, and this is what we try to communicate. This is the Keeling Curve, you all know that. This is uh, Gene Linden's graphic taken out of a book that uh, this graphic was in the uh, that environmental rag, Fortune Magazine in January. This is simply the uh, rising number of anomaly, climate-driven anomalous events. Hottest hots, wettest wets, driest dries, windiest wind conditions, and it's turned up, as uh, the temperature has also. This is stuff you already know. This is IPCC's third report, 2001. The fourth report is uh, out in draft form now. The range of uh, temperature estimates for this century run from 2.5 in Fahrenheit uh, metric to about 10.4 degrees, we now have good reason to believe that this is half of the story. It could be twice as fast, twice as large. It could be five degrees at a minimum, up to 20 or more degrees. We just don't know. Um, Where was that headline? This, uh, that was taken out of Science Magazine. And I don't have, do I have a date on it? No, I don't. This came out, uh, the, the background behind this, a group of scientists in Britain hooked together a bunch of spare computers, uh, accessing their spare computing power, and effectively got a distributed supercomputer. Uh, began to rerun the numbers, found that climate is much more sensitive than previously thought. And so this may or may not be reflected after it's vetted through various governments, ours and the Australian government being probably the two uh, worst in this. But the, uh, the evidence now is, I think, going to be reflected at least in part in the, this fourth IPCC report that is now in draft form that uh, climate change could be faster and more severe. Um, the record here, you've all seen things like this. The record now, the ice core record, in which they, they have a very, uh, they call, was it, thermometry? A very good record of temperatures, and it's based on the ratio of carbon-18, or probably oxygen-18 and oxygen-16 found in air bubbles in ice, core, uh, ice cores, and it's uh, a very reliable, precise record. And it now goes back about 650,000 years. If you had a pivot record, the record now goes back about a million or uh, a little bit more. New Orleans. This is 10 years of storm tracks up to the mid-1990s. The broader the track, the more severe the storm. This is what it looked like in the next 10 years. We don't know, scientists are not yet willing unanimously to say that climate change will drive the number of storms, but they are saying it will drive the severity of storms. This is Carrie Emanuel's piece that appeared in Nature on uh, August 4th of last year. Uh, similar results of a study that appeared just a little bit later in Science Magazine, so that we know that global warming, warming seawater, will increase, and the Earth is just a big uh, heat engine, will increase the severity of storms. This is New Orleans. The IPCC third report estimated about a one meter, about a 40-inch 40, 40 sea level rise uh, over the course of this century. Uh, March 24th of this year, uh, the data came out that, in fact, ice is melting much more rapidly at the poles and glaciers are melting much more rapidly. So we might be looking at a six to seven meter sea level rise, most of which would be in this century. Uh, New Orleans simply disappears. Climate anomalies, uh, because of the distribution of heat by the way the Earth works, the physical system were felt first in the north, but you know that. This is July uh, of this summer in the United States, climate anomalies. This was Europe, but you've seen that. Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. And here I want to get down to the heart of what I want to say. How am I doing time? Oh, gee whiz. Um, this appeared uh, two years ago, I believe it was. This was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. It was a large document. It's published now in four uh, big volumes. But in the summary assessment, it says the future is going to be a lot more surprises. Nonlinearity is their word for surprise. And we're not going to like it. These are not going to be good. So this is not going to be like Christmas Day. This is going to be like hell. Uh, we don't know. Theoretically, some of these surprises could fall on the good side, but that's not likely. Now, here's the problem we have. The day this appeared, this was page eight of the New York Times, our national newspaper, and they gave it about six column inches. Front page was Terry Schiavo and Michael Jackson. Now, as important as Terry Schiavo's case might have been and Michael Jackson's woes uh, maybe are, I don't know. 
uh, the fact that the planet is dying was page eight news. Now to their credit, they did run a Science Times piece on it later. This isn't global warming. This is planetary destabilization. This is rising sea levels, bigger storms, more disease, famine, drought, heat waves, changing ecosystems, coral bleaching, now half the corals in the earth, political and economic disorder. And we already kill, according to the World Health Organization, because of climate-driven weather events, 150,000 people, all right? Now, uh, the long and the short is we've got to go from a world that releases from both the combustion of fossil fuels and the management of carbon in forests and agriculture from 8.5 billion tons of carbon to give or take around three. Don't have long to do it. Now, here's what I want to say. This is the imagery of our time. On September 10th of 2001, if I had said, what's the iconic image? You all would have selected probably uh, the Apollo photo of Earth from the Apollo mission. Uh, or that done, uh, we had on the screen here the other day, uh, the Earth from uh, the moon. Uh, we were paralyzed with fear. And fear was used, I don't want to put too fine a point on it. Fear was used to drive the public to do things we otherwise would not want to do. We chose, or it was chosen for us, we didn't do this, to declare war in what was essentially a criminal act. And fear has been manipulated. Tom Ridge said this as he left the office as the first director of the Office of Homeland Security. But it isn't just the political manipulation of fear that we're up against. We want to tell stories, but people cannot hear stories if they're paralyzed by fear. But we've also undergone a century of the largest effort ever to deflect human intelligence. This is Edward Bernays, uh, nephew of Sigmund Freud, came to the United States. This is the guy that created the modern advertising firm. Uh, we now spend a half a trillion dollars a year based on a good bit of Bernays' work. And so the public to whom we try to communicate has already been uh, badly damaged, their ability to hear the messages by Edward Bernays. Bernays was hired by the cigarette industry to sell cigarettes. And being a Freudian, you don't sell cigarettes by appeal to the superego or even to the rational self. You appeal to the id. And how he appealed to the id was to say, uh, look, half of our market isn't smoking cigarettes. That's women. How do you get women to smoke cigarettes? Well, his campaign was to make cigarettes, the smoking of a cigarette, a little torch of freedom. And he staged events in New York City with lots of cameras and so forth. And so women smoking cigarettes, little torches of freedom. And then cars, when Bernays began his work, cars were, uh, you could have any color of car you want. According to Henry Ford, as long as it was black, they all looked the same. It was a utilitarian device. Uh, so people bought one car, kept it for eight, nine, ten years till it wore out. Bernays, hired by General Motors to sell more cars, makes a car what? Again, not appealing to the superego or the ego, to the id. Make cars symbols of sexual potency. And it worked. And then the phrase, the engineering of consent, that's Edward Bernays. Because he was then hired by political uh, parties to sell candidates in the same kind of way. This is the world that we're trying to work in. Now, I don't know exactly what Dolce and Gabbana sell. They're obviously in the agricultural field. <laughs> but this works. I don't, maybe they're selling poultry. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, this, uh, no, no pun intended, by the way, with that. Um, and then you come to the problem that Paul Hawken identified years back that every kid 10 years of age can identify on average about 1,000 corporate logos but fewer than 10 plants and animals native to the places in which they live. You try to tell your stories to those kids. They have been damaged. Uh, this is my version of Abraham Maslow. I'm going to speed up here a little bit, but Maslow, you know, infantile self-gratification. If we really get good at life and we mature, we move up here to this sense of transcendence and so forth, but that's not what that half a trillion dollars is spent to do. That is spent to drive us right back down into infantile self-gratification or into fear. As long as people don't know or confuse who they are with what they have, they are very dependable. They will tell their own stories, and they won't be yours. They won't be mine. As long as they're afraid, uh, they won't be able to tell anything. And then try to communicate. I said this the other day. This is the Fairness Doctrine, established in 1949, overturned by Reagan's FCC in 1987. It meant that to hold license now to the public airwaves, uh, television and radio stations, uh, you no longer have to present all sides of an issue. It's profitability. As long as you make a profit, that's all you have to do. 
try to tell your stories. In Mansfield, Ohio, I will tell you you run into Rush Limbaugh, a dome put down over that area that sells Rush Limbaugh and Gordon Liddy and Susan Coulter and, you know, 24-7. Try to tell stories in that market. Telecommunications Act did the rest. Uh, ben Badikian, I mentioned the other day, uh, when he wrote Media Monopoly in 1980, there were 50. He complained that there were 50 major media outlets. Now we're down to five. News homogenized, trying to tell the story of climate change in that kind of environment. And then there's this little problem. Uh, based on the World Press Association, based on very objective criteria, rates the U.S. press 27th in terms of freedom and objectivity. 27th. Uh, I'm going to skip through these. You know this uh, income distribution has gotten increasingly skewed. But what this means is, if you've read uh, Barbara Ehrenreich's book, Nickel Dime, you know that now increasingly try to tell your stories to impoverished people. The woman who's supporting four kids has got a deadbeat husband working uh, three jobs, uh, all for less than minimum wage or minimum wage and below. She's in poverty. What kind of story can she hear? What kind of story can the man hear whose job was just shipped uh, down to Mexico or whatever? This has an effect on, and this is, uh, let me just skip over that. Our language increasingly, because of distribution of income, the political dialogue shifted to the far right, everything to the left, everything that used to be left of center. Bring back Republicans like Dwight Eisenhower of the 50s, and they would now be in the radical extreme left. Our political discourse has shifted. Our attitudes maybe or may not have shifted, but the political discourse has shifted dramatically. Between fear and possibility. Now, I want to do a real quick reconstruction. How do we tell stories that people can hear? Two more minutes. This is going to be really fast. How do we tell stories that people can hear? How about starting with biblical language? When Martin Luther King began to reframe our attitudes on race, he drew from the Bible and the Constitution. Uh, how about the geometry of politics? We're told the story that Rush Limbaugh and the right wing tells us is we're right and left. I've never believed that. We, in fact, are caught between the present, our behavior, and the future. The language that we've told ourselves, the documents of American history, starting with the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, this is beautiful language. In the preamble of the Constitution, posterity is mentioned one time. And the founders of this country, for all their flaws and whatever, did believe that they were passing on to the future life and liberty, and property, maybe or maybe not happiness. But they, they use that kind of language that we've lost. It's the language of rights. Uh, Aldo Leopold, could we draw on our contemporary writers and thinkers, say of the past century, to weave this into a narrative about our role in the natural world and then our position? Could we begin to tell stories about basic rights, not right and left, but present and future. And what you see on the screen is a uh, combination of Thomas Jefferson and Aldo Leopold and Rachel Carson and Bill McDonough and lots of other people, but no generation has the right to change the biogeochemical cycles of the earth, read carbon and nitrogen in particular, or alter or impair the stability and integrity and beauty of biotic systems. The consequences of which are always a form of remote intergenerational tyranny. That is language that appeals back to our past. That's a storyline that we ought to use. I like this quote in Alan Leopold and uh, Carol and I'm just about done here. A human being is part of a whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He or she experiences himself or herself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to our affection for a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion, embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. I like that. That is the language of liberation. And then Richard, this is Richard Louv's uh, book that came out last year called Last Child in the Woods. If you haven't seen it, read it. It's a... It's a uh, Marvelous account of what we're doing to children. Want to tell stories? They have to begin early. We've got to begin to tell stories to children early on so they can tell stories themselves. They have models and they have images. So they can hear stories. And the stories that they need to hear involve changing the way they experience nature early on. Um, that's my grandson.
I had to get him in there somehow. You, you can't give a PowerPoint talk about having grandkids in. This is just one of the three of them. The stories we tell have got to be stories about our children and their children. And they have to be stories for our children and their children. How do we tell those stories? We cannot avoid the truth. Our obligation is to tell the truth about climate change and biotic impoverishment and all of these things as faithfully and as honestly as we can see it and as we can tell it. And that's through a glass darkly. We're going we're to miss some of these things. But so far, we, the science, I think, is becoming increasingly clear. And the, the message is not good. What we have got to do is to transcend this. Uh, and this is the final slide. We've got to begin to tell stories that change political reality now. We don't have time to wait. Gore says 10 years, and I think that's probably right. It may be even uh, an exaggeration. We just don't have time. Then there is the decades it takes to change values. How did salad bars go from California to Ohio? There's an interesting story. Uh, they may not have stopped at Kansas. Uh, I'm not supposed to say anything about Kansas. But, uh, and then hope. How does the spiritual world change? That's a different kind of language. And changing spirit, that is the spirit of the age, and that's, that's a longer term process. All of our efforts ought to be, have that kind of layering. There are the things we have to do first. The patient brought in the emergency room, you have got to staunch the bleeding, stabilize vital signs. You can later get back and talk about lifestyle, but the first things first. And the first things are to tell the public that we are in serious jeopardy. This is to quote uh, uh, Winston Churchill. We don't have anything to offer the public right now except blood and toil and tears and sweat. That's the hard reality of it. Will they rally to that? Well, they did in World War I. They did in World War II. They have on other occasions. They did in the Civil War. And you could pick out numerous historical examples. And then the longer term hope, we have to hold that out. That is the belief that we can rise above the things that have held us back. That that universe story, in fact, is our story. Uh, thank you very much.